fuck out of here, nigga. You was fake in the hood, nigga. No like that oh, ass, nigga. I think the career of Adolf Reed is over and it's not because people give a fuck about his bullshit with the COVID stuff. I think he has finally split his own base because he let the cat out the bag. He exposed that some of his friends are actually working with Nazis. And we're not supposed to notice this uh, left right alliance that has been forming with these socialists. So his audience is pretty upset. It's not so much Trump as that really shadowy, ugly um, you know, underworld of ultra right, right, right wingers. I mean, neo Nazis are. I don't even know what neo means in this case, right? But um, who, ironically and unfortunately, understand organizing, right? Much, much better than the posturing leftists do. So like they've got these various news services and then there's shit like at the high end, um, Ju Julius Krein, um, who uh, uh, has this new magazine called uh, American Affairs. Uh, it's funny because he contacted me. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I mean, late in the spring about um, you know, doing a book review. He's gonna pay me $2,000 to do a book review. And being the person I am of my history, when I saw the name, I just assumed he was at least my age, was a Jewish neocon who was out someplace in Brooklyn with like a past that touched partisan review and right, right, and, and, and I mean that shit. And then I found out that he's the other kind, kind of Julius Klein. He's from South, South Dakota. He's eighteen years old. Right. And as a Nazi, basically, uh, uh, went to Harvard and and was a Trumper until he wasn't. Uh, and this uh, magazine is extremely well funded by Mellon or Scape or somebody like that. And and they've been fishing. Right. Because uh, they've contacted several of my friends. Um, and and they got Angela Nagel, but. she would got got already. Angry. Yeah. Uh, but they're trying to that they were trying to publish uh, people with reputations for being iconoclasts on on the left, and it's clearly like um, a, it's clearly a political operation that's you know, directed towards Trump trying to stir up shit and discord right, right among leftists. So this is Adolf Reed, the man who is always diverting discussions about race, acknowledging that there's a well-oiled white supremacist political machine out there. And at the same time, he is acknowledging that they're reaching out to a lot of his friends and himself. This is causing a lot of controversy on that side or in these little groups because a lot of these leftists are white supremacists. They have no problem with linking up with white supremacists on the other side as long as they could try to accomplish their goals. A lot of these academics and a lot of these spokespeople for these, this, this group, they're out here grifting. They have no problem taking money from Nazis. And because this is getting exposed by Adolf Reed, he kind of got himself in some shit. So they, they've got the money to do that, that, that kind of thing. They've got the foresight and and the organizational focus to do you know that sort of stuff and like that's in addition to all those um brown shirt types out there and and the bogus news operations like i'm sure you've you've seen a million ads for the epic times i think they yeah. call it, right it's, it's just young personable looking people right i mean they know how how to work that stuff and and my fear and like this is uh, you know, back to the Labor Party connection, that, uh, as Tony Mizaki used to say, like, if we can't find something, you know, we on our side can't find something credible to offer people who are suffering and who are going to be suffering more and more, 
um, that that makes sense uh, as an explanation of why they're suffering and that offers some some plausible route out then far more dangerous uh, elements in in society are going to do it. That is very funny coming from Adolf Reed. What are you offering black people, Adolf Reed? What about our suffering? I mean, like, what brand new idea are you guys bringing to us in regards to ending our suffering? And we've defaulted on, on, on that. There's no question about that. And, and, and I also think, I mean, I had a, um, I had an argument like with Alex Coburn uh, years and years ago uh, uh, about this. Like he had a period in the mid '90s when he was courting the militia movement, which was like the forerunner to these cl- clowns out there now. Uh, and he thought that you know we were like uh, like they were our natural brothers and so forth and so on. And I said to him, "Look, I mean, I can see what you're saying, but." Wait, wait, wait. You can see what he's saying. Nat- natural brothers in regards to what? What the fuck were you guys trying to do? The fact is, like, this is... The, the people who, who, who have bought into that have bought into a conspiratorial ideology and a community, right? And the thing about conspiratorial ideologies, like as Chip, as Chip Burley said, that... <clears throat> The absence of evidence is proof of the depth of the conspiracy, hmm. and, and it's an ontological commitment. Once somebody buy, buys into it, yeah, you might be able to, you know, win them over um, eventually. See, she's not asking the right questions. Win them over to what? What is the goal of this shit? What type of brotherhood do you have with them that you don't have with other black people, Adolf Reed? But it's it's like trying to drain the ocean with a teacup when the when the smarter focus is to try to connect with people before they come to the lure of that shit. And that takes us back again, you know, to getting out of Brooklyn and trying to figure out how to talk to other people. Yeah. I mean, that to me is like the Bernie model, which is, um, you know, there's so much purity and, and condemning people. Right. Who are, you know, who are, who are maybe like not in the militia yet, but you could see them going right. there. Yeah, right. And we do have I, this idea. The irony is that the purity politics is like not fighting. Right. For, yeah. Right. Yeah. you know, like not creating an alternative yeah. to that stuff. That's the purity politics because you're refusing to do anything to court people. And who's that? Who's then going to be paying the price? Right. You no, know, that's a very important point. Yeah. Um, I'm all for courting people, but what are we courting them to? What are we trying to get them to agree with? That's the problem I have with what the fuck you motherfuckers are doing. For me, you can believe whatever the fuck you want to believe. I don't even need to fucking shame you. I don't need to fucking embarrass you. I don't need you to be guilty i don't need you to fucking kiss my ass i don't need you to even like me but what i need at this point in time what black americans need right now the descendants of american chattel slavery need to have an understanding about reparations that's what we need and i can't have you motherfuckers bringing people over here telling me they are my allies but they are going to sabotage what i fucking need that disparity well well, that there are two basic um metrics of of justice or social justice one of them is what political scientist preston smith calls uh, the discourse of racial disparity or the norm of racial disparity which is which basically boils down to uh, radically understood uh, equality of opportunity, uh, and 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 according to that norm, the society would be just if, say, black people, but 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 other uh, you know designated groups um, you know, occupied different rungs of the social, political, and economic hierarchy, 
in percentages that were roughly equivalent, you know, más o menos to their proportion in the general population, right? So that's the principle of racial democracy. The principle of social democracy um, is um, is focuses on uh, overall inequality, right? And uh, the gap between uh, um, um, the rich and the capitalist class and everybody else. And in principle, either of them is a defensible um, uh, norm of justice. Um, and as a number of people argue, a lot of people are arguing now that they aren't mutually exclusive. And it's true, they are not logically uh, mutually exclusive, but they aren't dependent on each other either. Right. Um, and in black politics, for instance, as Preston Smith has argued and shown, from the mid 1930s to roughly like the end of the 1960s, um, black politics was driven by or was anchored to both norms, right? Both the norm of racial democracy and the norm of social democracy. And because they were um, so closely tied together practically, and, but, and by the way, one of the reasons that they were was that the people, who were most likely to support racial democratic ideals were also leftists, right? right. So, um, and because they were um, seemed to co coincide more than coexist for so long, it just became natural for people to think that they're basically like two versions of the same thing, but they aren't. And what we've argued, and what Merlin Chalquan and I have argued, and what I've argued, and what Walters argued is that increasingly over the last 40 to 50 years, what we see is um, that the ideal of racial democracy, which is what, what, what undergirds the focus on disparity as the main metric of inequality for, for, for concern, has um, preempted, displaced, eaten, pushed aside, murdered in the womb, um, you know, the uh, principle of social democracy, right? Uh, and, and what we have said uh, repeatedly um, is that um, the fundamental problem with the racial democratic ideal is that it assumes whatever, um, you know, the hierarchical structure of the society is and, and insists that blacks just be their appropriate percentage of the goods and bads, right? I mean, there was a, a black power minister in the late 1960s who argued actually that, that freedom would be when black people were 12% of everything from the corporate boardrooms to the homeless. Well, Adolf Reed is using some outdated paradigm to describe his opposition. Um, he's mischaracterizing the ideas that are floating around um, just look at his example. He's using some nameless preacher from the 1960s. And like, I don't know if anyone else is paying attention, but we're in 2020. Like, what the fuck is he talking about? Who exactly is your opposition now? Tell us what their ideas are. And then tell us why you oppose their ideas. Don't talk to me about some shit from the 60s is the mischief, the potential for mischief that a focus on, uh, on uh, the racial disparity as an explanation for even what, uh, what, what, what is apparently you know, the case that blacks are more vulnerable to serious illness and death from COVID-19 than the general population that not going beyond the focus on, uh, on you know, racial disparity doesn't help us understand um, you know, the causation, doesn't help us figure out what to do about it, uh, and worst of all, uh, can, can, can feed into um, the um, toxic cesspool of racial medicine that's always lying, lying beneath the surface, like in, in um, uh, in um, racial, uh, in medical field, uh, I mean, basically. Um, these people want to play both sides. They want to make all these arguments to pretend like racism isn't a serious factor, 
But on the other hand, they want to say we live in a society that is so fucked up that the mere mention of race will make these white supremacists surface in the medical field and take us down a path of eugenics. Like, if it is that fucking crazy, then we need to deal with race. We need to deal with racism. So the reason that I say that racism isn't the cause of anything Right. Is that and that's not to say that racism doesn't exist and that people aren't racist and that and and that institutionalized inequalities may not be in some way or aren't in some way connected with um, racist practices and attitudes, whatever. But what but what what I mean is that racism itself doesn't explain how any particular inequality comes to exist. Right. And if you want to. So, so it's not, as we say, as uh, the Walter and I say in the piece, um, racism as a diagnosis isn't an etiological one, right? Like it doesn't explain uh, you know, the cause or the sources of the inequality or, or, or injustice. It's a taxonomic diagnosis, and, 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 uh, by which I mean it tells us what, uh, uh, how we should categorize um, you know, the causal phenomenon. It doesn't tell us what it is, right? Uh, and since taxonomies uh, don't exist in the real world, but are all ideational constructions, it's calling it racism doesn't explain, even like what, with respect to um, 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 you know, the obvious, um, I mean, whipping boys of the anti-racist line, um, um, redlining. Right. So we know how redlining worked, right? And we know that w one of the factors that propelled red redlining as a practice was racist presumptions on the part of the real estate industry, and to some extent, uh, um, well, uh, the real estate industry, the mortgage industry, and to some extent, public officials, and uh, and 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 also to some extent, white white homeowners. So that's a good one. Whew. He thought he was going to deny that redlining was racist, right? Um, I think even he had to get it together as he was formulating his thoughts. So let's go ahead and continue on. But I defy anybody to tell me or to explain to me how racism produces um, COVID death disparities, right? And you get like a narrative that goes back, you know, to 1619 or to 1850 or to 1895 or to 1945, you know, 1960. But from the standpoint of specific individuals who are working front front line jobs, yes, it's certainly true that that blacks and Hispanics are more likely to be concentrated in low wage frontline jobs than than whites, and that the reasons for for that disproportionate concentration have partly to do with racist practices in in the past, right? That doesn't say that doesn't really tell you much about how those people are concentrated in those jobs today, because racist practices in the past put them in a position uh, in, in 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 a comparatively weak um, I'm a labor market position, and you might say that there's discrimination. Uh, that I mean, there probably is to be sure. Uh, um, um, uh, there's some some degree of discrimination, but to say that racism explains why they are disproportionately in frontline, low wage, precarious employment, um, um, overcrowded housing. Um, ha, um, show like the medical conditions that are associated with an, with a, inadequate access to healthcare doesn't really point us in a direction of trying to remedy any one of those conditions, right? So it's so so that so takes me back to the point about taxonomy <clears throat> that the racism diagnosis um, really is all about telling us the name that we should call the injustice by, right? I mean, not how we should address it and. And that's one of the reasons that it makes sense, I believe, that that people think that uh, you know anti-racist politics is the response 
uh, because it makes sense. It's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. All right, so Adolph Reed is playing a weird semantics game right now. And he, you see, he even he had to litter that whole thing with a bunch of caveats that really undermined his whole argument. But regardless of that point, the reason why people keep bringing up race in these type of discussions is so that we can thread all of these events together to form a, a case in regards to redress. And ultimately, it really doesn't make any fucking difference, whether it's capitalism or racism or any other fucking ism. The end result is the people that have been targeted with this disproportionate and continuous mistreatment. Um, And that um, but how, for instance, and I know some people will object that this is a cheap shot, but how the Academy Awards uh, you know, decision to uh, um, in, include, as it were, in inclusion as a category for um, the best picture Oscar is supposed to speak to uh, the overcrowded housing like in East Harlem is uh, you know, beyond me. And Do you see how this dumb shit gets to fly? Like, what the fuck does the one thing have to do with the other thing? Like, how is this motherfucker considered an intellectual? I mean, would you even consider the Oscar so white political action? Like, what the fuck are we even talking about here? More black people aren't winning. Uh, well, well, no, I'm not opposed to the idea that more black people ought to win Oscars for all the shitty movies that get made. Anyway, right? Um, and, and frankly, I wouldn't care. Right. Um, it's. It's um, it's like not an issue I'm concerned about, right? But more power to them if, uh, as part of jockeying within the motion picture industry for for a position. I mean, that's uh, all right. I wish them luck, even. But my problem is that is with the extent to which that uh, guild and other narrow concerns are projected as as the equivalent of 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 a general egalitarian um, posture and program. And and look at, I mean, I'm also like. Like he went from talking about something serious, like motherfuckers dying from COVID to talking about award shows, like it's in the same fucking conversation. Like what the fuck, yo? And this is a political scientist that is comparing life and death situations to fucking awards for entertainment. Um, but but and it does amount to and we said this, too, that that anti-racist remedies of of the anti disparitarian sort. Right. Um, often amount to a, a kind of racial version of a trickle down policy, right? Like uh, making more black people rich and rich black people richer is somehow supposed to make make my life better. Right? And what you're proposing is supposed to make my life better. I'm not interested in this this game that you guys are playing. I am talking about a wealth redistribution to the American descendants of slavery based on the fact of all these injustices that we've had to endure and the economic damages that have been placed upon us. Now, if you're not interested in having that type of conversation with me, then I'm not going to agree to whatever the fuck you're talking about as far as the coalition is concerned. Um, it's difficult, if not impossible, to imagine how we could prevail on any of the redistributive programs and agendas that we need for working people of whatever race, creed, color, prior condition of servitude, sexual orientation, whatever, apart from building a, a broad, deep coalition among the majority of people in this country. And, you know, the, like we always said, said, said during the Labor Party experience, like the most fundamental um, um, identity, right, in, in the United States, 
uh, the most broadly shared and the most deeply consequential is the identity of somebody who's expected uh, to go work for a living every day. And that just seems seems to me to be the base on which we start to construct the solidarity. And that's not to suggest that the differences aren't there. They obviously are. I mean, anybody who's ever spent any time time around a union, uh, right. except maybe the brother of the sleeping car porters, understands right the basis for tensions and 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 butting heads over difference. But do you do you, do you get farther by butting heads over difference? From uh, from a foundation in a solidaristic understanding of of shared interests, or do you get there by hectoring people about um, uh, about how they need to acknowledge their their privilege, right, or um, atone for for their for the sins of their grandparents or whatever? I, I, I mean, it just seems like bullshit, frankly. Yeah. We do not share the same interests. I do not need white people to come to me explaining their privilege or feeling shame or making atonement as far as some verbal uh, uh, appeasement or appeal. What I am looking for is reparations. As long as they do that, we can work together. Anything else, we're at odds. And for some reason, you're not understanding this, even though you keep trying to push through your way. And we are the ones who are at odds with what the fuck you're saying. We are rejecting your 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 arguments. Now, how are you going to adapt? You can't win without us. Um, It's it's funny because, I mean, what always strikes me is that they're kind of two overlapping issues um or related issues one is like and i i'm guilty of this i have to admit because there is a lot of pressure to kind of virtue signal or not look like a class reductionist so um and i will say i mean i'm almost embarrassed to say sometimes to say like i do care about white working class people Mm -hmm. as well and i'm not like downplaying racism but i do care about them Right. So what I often find myself doing is saying, which is true, that even if you hate these people, and I kind of make this as a rhetorical argument, yeah. um, even if you hate these people, you have contempt for them. Like you're a lib who hates them. Right. You think all white working class people right. who don't love, you know, uh, who don't hate Trump, they all have one, two right. among them, sleep with their sisters, all those like offensive tropes. Like, right. don't you get that they actually, that there's power in numbers? Right. So you yeah, have to, it's yeah. like, mind-boggling to me power and numbers to do what exactly we are trying to get racial justice it makes no sense for me to add these people into my coalition if they're going to just dilute the focus because they're looking for something that benefits themselves like they have to be on board with racial justice also and this isn't about hate this is about self-preservation. The number that I keep tossing around is between six and a half million and over nine million people who voted for Trump in 2016 voted for Obama at least once. So maybe some of them and, you know, like the, the um, you know, the drugstore shrinks will provide a psychoanalytic or pop psychoanalytic uh, uh, explanations for it, right? They were, they voted for Obama to show that they weren't racist, but then they couldn't stand it and they voted for Trump, right? Because they couldn't stand it. Right. So this is a political scientist that has given us this oversimplified analysis of this whole situation. Now, do you remember this clip I showed at the beginning of the video? Apparently, there's some sophisticated uh, political machine being ran by a bunch of fucking Nazis. This is from Adolf Reed. So if that's the case and these Nazis are contacting him, a black man, to do work for them, then maybe this race shit is a little bit more nuanced than Reed is letting on right now. Now, also, according to Reed, when we talk about voters and them possibly being racist, we can only see it from this surface level analysis. 
if I were to use the same logic and apply it to world history, could I then say that the fucking Nazis, the real fucking Nazis, weren't actually white supremacists because they aligned themselves with the Japanese? No, that's that's fucking ridiculous. And I'm not saying that I need every fucking uh, Trump supporter to come out and, and admit that they are racist and blah, blah, blah. No, nah, I don't give a fuck about all of that shit. I'm just saying don't give me these weak arguments like this is really intellectually dishonest right but 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 the I, the possibility right that um that they voted for trump for the same false promises that led them to vote for obama uh just is something that people won't won't acknowledge and as a great essay that we published in Nonsight, uh, right after the 2016 election by a friend and colleague named Le- Leslie Lopez at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and it's called, I forget the exact title, but I mean, people can find it. Um, uh, but it's about um, two Trump voters, right? And they were her parents, or two Latino Trump voters who were her parents. Mm. Right? Her father's a union man. He, he worked with Chavez and UFWOC. Uh, and- Cesar Chavez, just so people know. Oh yeah, thank you. Sorry, no. uh, and uh, and and was a steward in a meatpacking local, and and was an AFGE when he worked on a military base. Her mother's a social worker, and what her father said to her when she was hectoring him about it was, "I I believe Trump like I believed Obama," and you know when you think about it, like there's a way, and I guess I should duck when I say this, right? duck from the internet there's a way that that obama kind of opened the door for trump right because obama's line was never really that there was that he was connected to any kind of progressive political agenda he embodied a progressive political agenda because of his race and his personal story and the personal story was what we were given to understand was gonna help us overcome or counteract or mitigate the effects of the financial crisis and 40 or 30 years of, of neoliberalization. And it didn't do it, right? Uh, and so if, to the extent that um, the mystique of electing the first black president was a false promise to take care of all these, then the Pied Piper of Bavaria comes along uh, and says, yeah, well, it really, race really is the embodiment of what will make your life better. It's just not that version of it. Like, it's, 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 it's this version of it. And a scary thing that I've heard from... Um, How is this man taken seriously? So apparently, Barack Obama's black skin was supposed to be the progressive policy that just he didn't speak about. But it was just assumed by these voters that his black skin was going to lead to progress. And then we're supposed to say that that same mind didn't look at Trump and say, "Okay, that white skin is going to lead us to progress. No, they heard racist rhetoric from Trump and that racist rhetoric is supposed to register in their mind as a progressive policy. Like this shit doesn't make any motherfucking sense. This is just some rambling that's supposed to sound deep to shallow people. Uh, but yeah, no, the thing is, like, we just need, uh, and yeah, you know, I'm not even sure, and like, this is when I get dispirited out, but I'm not even sure that what we think of as a left here um, has the capacity, the will, the heart, um, the other directedness um, to um try to do the hard organizing work that's got to be done to to resist this um i mean i'll say that, that this too i might have mentioned this uh, i mean last time we were on but my old friend and comrade jane jane mcalevy's new, new book no no shortcuts uh, i think she's got another one coming out so it'll be the not quite so new book um makes a big deal of a distinction between what she refers to as mobilizing and what she right. refers to as organizing and 
mobilizing presumes that you have a constituency that's there that you can basically reach with what used to be called a phone tree, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, and we don't have that, right? We haven't had, had anything like that for a long time. Uh, but people don't want to... Um, I think to some extent it's like um, a language transition, right? Where the switch just hasn't been flipped, right? Like you, you're trying to speak Spanish, but you hear in English first and then translate inside your head. Um, but um, partly th there are structures of political economy, right? That the mobilizational apparatus feeds, feeds into like uh, jobs, what are called organizers who are really more like technicians who can mm -hmm. do bullhorns and, and campaigns and whatnot, right? Um, partly it's the fantasy land, right? That, that, that the sort of pious left, left, left lives in, like but with the idea that you've got to bear, bear witness, right? And a bear witness becomes like a, a part of the politics. But it's clear, right, that, um, and the Sanders campaign showed this too. And I think Bernie did as good a job as anybody could have done of trying to operate uh, in the electoral realm. But it showed that we don't have an electoral constituency out there for, for our agenda, and we need to make it. And that's what we can spend the four years doing, right? Try, trying to organize. But what organizing means fundamentally is building a base and expanding it and consolidating it and then building and, 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 and expanding again. Do you see how demoralized they are in defeat? And yet they're still delusional about the superiority of their ideas. You don't hear anything about them adapting their ideas. You don't hear anything about changing their perspective. They think they can just smash through the same ideas that they've been trying to smash through for the past eight fucking years. They think organizing is the difference maker, but the truth is they have nothing without the black vote. That That's a politics that doesn't do anybody any good, right? And it's not going to help us get to anywhere we need to get to. And I mean, um, I can't remember if I've said, said, said this number yet. I mentioned it earlier today, but uh, the six and a half to nine million people who voted, uh, yeah, for Trump. I, um, I did say it earlier, like for Trump, um, who voted for Obama. I mean, you got to explain that somehow, right? Just like um, I saw a douchebag who shall remain nameless for the moment, uh, uh, bragging on me in a pretty ugly way, speaking like a, of another one of the woke white white fellows um, about. Uh, social security stuff and he kind of pushed this line again that two thirds of the people no two thirds of black workers were excluded from initial coverage under social security because they oh, were right. workers and domestic workers and this has been like the jumping off point for for a new deal so so racist line right but, I think uh, so racist yeah to Ray Reed has pointed out, a problem with that is that while two thirds of black workers were excluded, almost three fourths of all workers who were excluded under those provisions were, were white. Hmm. So, all right, first of all, we gotta get it straight. Two thirds of all black workers were locked out. And we have to put that in context of understanding that black people were kind of forced into agriculture as our fucking employment. But Adolf Reed is playing a fucking word game. We're talking about all of black workers when we say two thirds. Then he's trying to switch it and talk about just the type of workers who were in that industry who were uh, excluded from uh, Social Security. He's trying to say that three fourths of those people were white, but that doesn't reflect how it affects the overall white community but but to be fair the reason why we're having this conversation is in a greater discussion about redress and we have to look at this thing in the context of a long series of atrocities 
and and discrimination that has disproportionately and often the vast majority of time been exclusively targeted at black Americans who descend from American chattel slavery. Now, in this situation, if someone were to say, "Okay, we want to do a specific form of redress for all the families who are affected by this New Deal policy, something completely separate from reparations as the greater discussion, then fine. I'm all for that. Now, I would want to be careful because I would still want it to be completely understood that reparations is still the the priority here. And for reparations, pure reparations, in my mind, would be closing the racial wealth gap. And I, I'm, I'm um, very wary of like allowing that greater thing to be lost into someone like breaking this down into uh, separate events. But I want to be clear, if you're going to make a counterpoint like Adolf Reed is trying to do right now, this is the way you do it. You say, OK, we want to make sure that we compensate all of those families regardless of race. That is the only legitimate counter argument. Or at least that's the only logical conclusion that a counter argument should lead us to. There's, so there's no question that Southern congressmen uh, wanted to protect their um, planter class constituents, uh, you know, access to low wage black labor. They also wanted to protect their upper class constituents access to low wage white labor. And the growers in the West, right, also wanted to protect, uh, you know, their access to low wage white or Latino labor. And frankly, um, you know, the racial descriptor is the adjective. The low wage labor is the noun, right? Uh, uh -huh. And I mean, that's what what was most most significant. So, what does it do for us, right, uh, to have people who are ostensibly progressives now? I mean. Well, I mean, there used to be a phrase back, uh, uh, back, back in in earlier um, phases of the communist movement, uh, left and form, right in essence. And uh, what kind of leftism is it that uh, that insists on attacking shit the New Deal, right? But your universal programs across the board. I mean, this is a left that is not only. In, in bed with, but is actively making babies with neoliberalism, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't mean, I've never understood that. It's like, okay, well, to the extent that, I mean, we, the New Deal was created then. No one's pretending that racism, as you said, the war on racism, I mean, no one's pretending there wasn't racism. So obviously right. things are going to be reflected in that. Right. It's like yeah. the fact that, I mean, no one says about Obama's like Lily Ledbetter thing, which made it easier for women basically to sue for harassment or discrimination. No one's like, well, is that going to end sexism? No, yeah. everyone saw yeah. it as a good thing. Right. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's uh, I, I don't really know if pe people seem to think it's a really smart thing to, to, to observe. But as you said, they're not even actually being precise about the the types of uh, discrimination and disenfranchisement that went on with the New Deal. But why wouldn't you just say that, like, and this is what we need to fight for and make it that much more inclusive as yeah, opposed yeah, to, like, yeah. throwing it away? Throw it all away. Who is saying throw away the New Deal? It already happened. Fucking almost a fucking century ago. How are we throwing it away now in 2020? What we're saying is a fair critique of the New Deal and the reason that we're making that critique is to make sure that people understand that we need to have some form of compensation paid out to black people for shit like this that has continuously happened. And it's not only happened on the right, because a lot of you on the left are playing a game where you're pretending like the left never reinforced white supremacy. Like it's not even a possibility for leftists to be and involved in anything like that and we need to be clear to cut the bullshit all around um oh does reed uh but does professor reed believe class dynamics applies to native americans or was the intent of cultural eradication ah 
crap. Where'd that go? Um, bent on militaristic white supremacy, being they weren't being they weren't intended to participate in labor. Here, I'll put that up there. Oh, okay. Well, I think this. I mean, um, that um, you know, Native Americans. Well, in Native Americans were the victims like of empire building, right? And the empire building is fundamentally a class project, right? And people. This is actually a good question for Adolf Reed because he likes to nitpick the mainstream telling of race in American history. And it's true that there are a lot of misconceptions, but he's not doing it from the perspective of trying to uh, bring accuracy to the story. Um, he wants to cherry pick his own little details of American history so that he can tell a different narrative about race, one where it doesn't have much of a determining factor in the social economic development of this country. And usually when he does this, he goes through the history of black and white people in America and he cherry picks these details to to allow him to come back and say capitalism was the thing that uh, ignited the slave trade and uh, created all these dynamics between white and black people. And it gives you an excuse to avoid any reckoning on race because it gives you the scapegoat of capitalism. But if you have to talk about the Indians, then it becomes a different story. Any little exception to the rule that you find in regards to black and white dynamics doesn't apply when you're talking about the natives. It is a whole other ball game. Because it's a different experience, different history, his normal analysis of race falls apart when talking about the natives. So what he's going to do right now is start talking about black people. And the empire building is fundamentally a class project, right? And people kind of lose sight of the fact that, uh, well, a friend of mine just said this morning that, that that um, you know, white supremacy, I think a way to look at the relationship between white supremacy and capitalism is that white supremacy has, has been at different points the scaffolding that, that, that helps to solidify the building or helps to hold up the building while it's being constructed, right? Um, and once the building is solid and sturdy, you don't need the scaffolding anymore. Right. And like this came up in discussion of how how much um, the um, public recognition, public historical commemoration has changed in Charleston, South Carolina, since I first started going down there to visit, like in the late 70s. I mean, I remember the first first time I ever went to Charleston. Um, the the um, placard on the house where John Calhoun wrote. Wrote, wrote the nullification ordinance was bubbly, right? I mean, this is where he, 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 he wrote it. Uh, you know, next time I'm down there, like in the late 80s or no, probably early 90s, um, you know, the language is moderated a little bit. Um, and by the time we started working down, down there at the end of the 90s, um, it was all, all, all multi-culti. And, and the city um, about a year ago uh, made a big to do of erecting an historical marker on the battery to Robert Charles, the slave um, ship's pilot who stole um, a ship and and sailed like forty some slaves to to, uh, to freedom behind um, Union lines, and that never would have been thinkable in the late 1970s or 1980s. And the crescendo of this, like in Charleston, was a few weeks ago, month month or two ago, whatever. Uh, pandemic time, just all... all yeah, no, it's all yeah. flattened, yeah. Yeah, but they took... Uh, there, there's this massive pedestal, or, or a big sculpture of John C. Calhoun on a massive pedestal uh, in the heart of downtown. It was quite like, like the Robert E. Lee I mean, statue here. 
And the city took it down. And the city took it down without cavil. There was no beef or anything. That would have been absolutely unthinkable in 1990. Uh, and class relations haven't changed and and that means from a superficial glance right like um the the um, apportionment of goods and bads in 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 the local polity along race lines at first glance doesn't look look like it's changed that much right i mean most of the conspicuously poor people are black uh, most of the conspicuously rich people are white um, but they have changed, right? Uh, I mean, the class class dynamics, because you know what? Turns out you don't really need white supremacy for the ruling class to do what it wants to do. So in the same interview where Adolf Reed is detailing how some Nazis have this well-oiled political machine and how there is this great threat of race medicine and eugenics popping up in America, he is telling us that taking down a fucking monument and erecting another monument is a sign that white supremacy is over and done with and no longer necessary. This is some bullshit that Adolf Reed himself doesn't even believe. And the clip I'm about to show you is a clip he did months earlier with the same motherfuckers. So, like, I'm in New Orleans. I was here... Uh, three years ago during the monument fight. Like my mother had just died here. So I was here, here, here for all of it. And I was struck then that, that the people who were leading the fight to take down the monuments then, and I hated those monuments. I hated them all, all my life. I had fantasies of dynamiting them when I was a kid. So I was happy to see them gone. But the people who were leading that fight were also neck deep in the charter school industry. Mm. And part of the outcome, right, was that uh, the current biracial, multiracial, interracial governing class is able to represent having gotten rid of an obsolete symbology of oppression uh, as a backhanded way to legitimize the current dynamic forms of oppression, right, exploitation. I hate how they allow this man to play dumb. And I hate all the motherfuckers who defend him. But let's get back into this whole motherfucking thing that's supposed to be about the fucking natives. But somehow it's going to turn into this a whole other arc of a story that's supposed to redefine race in America. Right. It was a useful thing. Like, uh, I mean, just keep keeping it Charleston for 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 a minute, like in the 18, late 1840s and 1850s. Uh, there's a great book on this uh, by uh, Johnson and Rourke, which I know sounds like a cooking school, uh, but it's called uh, Black Masters. It's a study of several generations of a black slave owning family in South Carolina. And, and they detail, and these guys aren't um, you know, ideologues. I mean, they're good historians, but, but they show how, um, you know, like into the 1840s, there was a significant free population, free black population in Charleston who were mainly craftsmen. And there was a, a substantial um, population of skilled slave workers and, and on more of a West, of West Indian model, um, the, the owners had worked out arrangements with the, um, um, uh, the skilled slaves that they could sell off uh, some of their labor um, to uh, others in in exchange for the master getting a cut of the proceeds, right? By the end of the 1840s, when uh, two things happened, uh, one was that the white immigrant population grew, and the other, the more consequential one, <clears throat> uh, uh, because until that point, um, the, the planter class showed a decided preference for free black artisan labor, uh, which tended to be a higher skilled, and also for um, slave craftsmen than for um, busted white white workers, basically, right? Who were just considered, I don't know, trash. Um, but starting uh, I mean, over the 
the 1850s, as it became clearer to the local um, planter class that secession was likely to become an issue, right? Um, th their, their response to white, free, free white workers began to shift. And they began like to emphasize their shared whiteness with these white white workers, and began and it showed up in the in in labor re regulation, so that the pendulum swung toward um, reducing the competition from free black and skilled slave slave workers, right? But it's driven by a political imperative. It's not driven, and yeah, like I'm sure you know all these guys are committed to white supremacy as an ideology and believed it because. Because one of the things that ideologies, my dad always pointed out, is is like a mechanism that harmonizes the principles that you like to think you believe in with what advances your material interests. Um, but white supremacy was functional, right, for for material objectives. Fast forward to the end of the nineteenth century and the defeat of the populist movement, you see the same thing, but even more aggressively, right, to an extent that white supremacy was in some ways um, imposed on white workers and 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 farmers uh, it, as almost as much as it what was on blacks, but in different ways with different consequences, obviously. All right, so we went from slave labor to talking about the free slaves to talking about how uh, our modern concept of white developed in labor. And Adolf Reed went into his normal diatribe about race relations in America. And it was all good except for one thing. Did you hear anything about the fucking natives? Did you hear anything about how the relationship with the natives developed? You got to pay attention to the games that this man is playing. So going back to like the Native American question. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, white supremacy emerges out of the conquest right but the point of the conquest is is um expansion of capitalism see these people like to be very specific about when the concept of race developed in america when the concept of whiteness developed in america because it allows them to spin a narrative so to be fair let's go ahead and be honest the concept of conquest predates capitalism. So what I was thinking was, okay, well, then if we can, if they can help consolidate, um, you know, the idea that the only serious um, and morally defensible norm for social justice is anti-disparitarianism, right? Or pursuit of equality, a real equality of opportunity in market capitalism then they can keep the thing going for for a while but the that's right adolf reed is pretty much arguing for you to have unequal opportunities and to suffer until capitalism falls apart your ability to succeed and to have the same level of comfort that adolf reed was able to achieve within this capitalistic society is a threat to his fucking goals and he's telling you that directly. But then the next move is, all right, so Katie, I'm sure is, is, is pro probably implicated like at the heart of this, but so like Sanders gets um, castigated as a cl class reductionist because he talks about the working class. And one of the rhetorical moves here is that working class gets re redefined as white. So you can't be black and be in a working class, even though statistically speaking, not to be a prude about this, uh, you're more likely to be in a working class if you're black than if you're white, right? I mean, just just, yeah. just given who does what what for a living and like the distribution of jobs. But you can't be. So you can either be black or working class. You can't be both. And to me, like that's first of all, a testament of the extent to which the black upper class and, and the professional managerial strata have won in defining what's publicly understood to be the domain of black black political aspiration. Hmm. These fucking leftists, everybody is manipulating the black people to be against you. It, it, there's no possible way 
that black people in their right mind could actually oppose what the fuck you're saying. We get the understanding that you're talking about the white working class when you say working class from people like you and the rhetoric that you use. Every time you talk about the working class, it is clear that we are not in consideration. It has nothing to do with some vague elite class. No, motherfucker, we just can hear with our own two ears the bullshit that you're saying and how we don't fit into it. Uh, Joy, Joy Ann Reed is kind of a pet of mine, like in this regard, right? Uh, in fact, just, just before I hit the Zoom link, right, I, I checked her annual salary and her net worth. Uh, because I just happened to see her on um, on a Daily Show in 2017, ragging on Bernie and explaining about how black people don't really care about stuff like Medicare for all or 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 free college or universally re redistributive programs, but they want stuff like the, they want to have the racial conversation and to have the reckoning about America's past. And I thought, gee, I wonder what black people she's been talking to. Mm -hmm. And then I double checked and saw she's a Harvard graduate. She makes she made then like a million and a half dollars a year and had a net worth of four million. So I'm pretty sure that the black circles that she runs in don't include a lot of people who would say, oh, wow, I can go to Penn State for free. What is going on in Adolf Reed's mind where he thinks he's the motherfucker that could play this type of game? Like, I'm no fan of Joy Ann Reed. But who the fuck is Adolf Reed to be pocket watching motherfuckers and to be talking about you not having black people in your motherfucking circle? It can't be this motherfucker who gets six figures from the University of Pennsylvania. And it can't be this motherfucker that I've only seen talk to another motherfucking black person maybe once or twice. And that's including it being his own fucking son. Um, I was going to my first meeting of a committee of an academic association and a colleague, a Harvard professor, in fact, um, whom I knew by reputation, but not, but hadn't met personally, called me as soon as I got, got to the meeting and said that she wanted to, she had to talk to me about the election and what, what I thought happened. And she mentioned this three or four times over the course of the day. And um, we finally, on a break at a glass of wine in the hotel bar. And the first thing I learned was that, as is so often the case when people say that they want to hear what you have to say, they, the reality was she wanted to tell me what she had to say. Right. And it was all about these busted, fucked up white people out there in the middle of nowhere who, like, you know, didn't do the right thing. And I'm yes butting her, right? Like, like crazy. And I even uh, resorted to my son's quip that um because he'd been living in central illinois for two and a half or three years at that point that if that either carrie talked about nafta or bush was going to talk about gay marriage right uh yeah. and 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 that's how it played out but she 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 stopped me finally because she wasn't having any of it right she wasn't having any um modifications and she finally said well face it Adolf." those people just aren't like us. So I said, oh yeah, well that's okay. That's what this whole game is. And, and this person was black by the way too. Uh -huh. but. Well, well, I mean, I think there's, there's a fair amount of solidarity in yeah. the black community that goes back to the era of slavery, for right. example. And it goes back to the era of what could be called the creation of blackness when you get all of these different African ethnicities from Angola in Southwest Africa, heading thousands of miles north to say Senegal on the bulge of Africa. And then they cross the Atlantic and they're given this new identity of blackness. It's just like you were referring to South Asians who are all sort of squashed into this identity, even though there are antagonisms between and amongst them. It's like Sikhs and Hindus, for example. Right. And I think that the crucible of cruelty that helps to create slavery then helps to forge a certain kind of solidarity amongst the, it's just like, I mean, as you may know, I mean, <laughs> I guess this still happens, but certainly with people of my generation, uh, particularly if you're on a campus, uh, a, a majority non-black campus, if you see another black person, you speak to them, 
when you say hello. I mean, it's part of this. You're sort of checking in each right, other yeah. to make sure <laughs> that the mob isn't coming. <laughs> right. All of you. And so there's a certain amount of solidarity uh, involved, and I think that that carries over. Now, one of my favorite tweets of hers was when she compared Bernie Sanders to your uh, college friend who roommate who doesn't pay rent and stays on your couch. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just so funny because I'm so loath to play to like play the anti-Semitic card or anti-Semite card. Right, right. But like the double standard and the sensitivity that's demanded from people in one direction and is not at all even considered in the other one. I'm just like, are you kidding? So I said, oh, yeah, well, that's OK. That's what this whole game is. And, and this person was black, by the way, too. Uh -huh. but After hearing about that black woman that Adolf Reed just threw under the bus. Do you want to take a guess why he didn't talk to Katie about the game she's playing? As my friend Walter Ben Michaels has said, the best way you can, um, or the best evidence uh, that somebody has a class position is that they deny they have one. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and that's how this thing works, right? So you dress what's a class position up in racial garb. And isn't that what nationalism always was, right? I mean, to begin with, right? Um, so then you get to denounce you know, anybody who has a different class position as a, who, or who's advocating for a different class perspective as a cl class reductionist. When, when what gets constituted as the racial agenda is pretty clearly a class agenda, right? Mm. Um, what is the racial wealth gap? For God's sake, right? I mean, that's what I mean. That's not something that's going to dribble down as far as me. You know what I mean? I mean, this what um, you rectify the racial wealth gap right. by um, creating black investment banking houses, right? That's what the story is. You make the point that white immigrant groups have at points in their history faced the same kinds of restrictions that black people have. I mean, access to, they were locked out of lending institutions. They were segregated in certain neighborhoods at some point. But you say that they've had a very different trajectory. You know, what, tell me more about that. In fact, you, you cite the Bank of Italy as an example, mm -hmm. which was formed when Italian immigrants faced discrimination and were ghettoized. What happened there? A very different history than that of most of the banks that ero arose to serve black people. What happened there and why so different? If you look at the Bank of Italy's example, it really does show the disparate impacts, the disparate sort of um, trajectories of the two different races. So um, Italians and Irish, uh, many other foreign-born Arabs, you know, um, uh, Mexican uh, immigrants, all sorts of people were also non-white. Some are still non-white, but um, looking at um, Italians and Irish specifically kind of just shows how, how these markets and sort of whiteness um, work. So um, but pre sort of New Deal, let's say, um, Italians and Irish were also also excluded in the way that blacks were. Although, um, if you look at segregation patterns, it was never quite as stark. So when you look at the black um, segregation patterns in, in certain spaces, blacks were much more segregated than Italians and Irish, but they were, Italians and Irish were excluded from a lot of these, um, these things. But post FHA, um, post sort of New Deal credit, Italians and Irish sort of get included in that American suburban credit market. So they do get the GI Bill. They're not restricted from certain colleges. They are able to buy in communities that are, you know, suburbs that are able to um, grow equity. And then, so you look at Bank of Italy, um, Bank of Italy starts as a bank, just like a lot of the black banks that I highlight in the book, as a response to exclusion. So when you have a black community or an Italian community excluded from the mainstream credit system, what happens a lot is that the entrepreneurs within the community establish their own bank. So Bank of Italy establishes because Italians aren't getting banked by other mainstream mm -hmm. institutions. But once Italians do become part of this FHA and GI Bill um, credit, Bank of Italy is able to thrive and, and um, survive. And, and it's in California, it's in San Francisco, and there's a lot of really great economic sort of um, tailwinds. And so uh, Bank of Italy then becomes sort of, you know, Bank of California, and then it, it is now Bank of America. Wait, you know, on the question of capitalism, I mean, you just sort of make the point in the book that black capitalism has been sort of embraced, you know, across the political spectrum throughout time. I mean, from Frederick Douglass to, you know, Richard Nixon to Barack Obama, who are all, you know, obviously very different people. You know, in theory, 
it should work, right? It, in theory, it should work. I mean, it goes back to one of the sort of the, the core principles of your book is that, you know, without wealth, there is political equality is very hard to attain. So why hasn't it worked? So so uh, Nixon really staked his uh, administration on black capitalism. And I, I focus on it a lot in the book because that's kind of the world we live in, right? This theory that, look, what black communities need is more capitalism and more entrepreneurship. His opponent during that election in 1968 is Hubert Humphrey, um, who says, you can't have black capitalism without capital. Right? And that's essentially the point I'm trying to make in the book. That's the point Frederick Douglass makes. So Frederick Douglass believes in capitalism, but he says you can't have freedom. You can't have capitalism without land. Right? Because if you don't have land, you actually don't have freedom. And that's essentially what happened. Frederick Douglass was proved right in the post-Civil Civil, um, War era. Is what, because slaves didn't have land, they lost the vote, they lost access to political systems, they lost equality and freedom. We can keep talking about entrepreneurship and um, opportunity zones and things like that, but we have to look at the structures of how capital, capitalism works and what cap, the laws of capitalism are. Capital just grows unto itself, right? Um, if you don't have capital, you, it's really hard to get capital if the structure of capitalism is just going to keep sort of um, perpetuating certain things um, to, toward capital, right? So I think looking at homes today, right, looking at um, the way that property uh, increases in value or decreases in value, when you still see that bl wealthy black people, their properties aren't increasing in value if they live in a predominantly black neighborhood, that's, that's capitalism, right? That's the market coding, the racial preferences of market participants, right? And so insofar as the market is coded with racism, capitalism is not gonna work. But I also wanna make the point that we actually have never really had true capitalism in America. I think that's one of the biggest myths is we have had a lot of subsidies um, for white families. The FHA, the New Deal, um, GI bills, FHA, that was not capitalism. That was the government coming in, um, making maps of certain neighborhoods and guaranteeing mortgages in white neighborhoods and not guaranteeing them in black neighborhoods. So if you're gonna look for where capitalism has, has been, it's been in the black neighborhoods. They've had no government subsidies, whereas white neighborhoods have had government subsidies. Looking at the, the tax code, right? We have a tax code that benefits the middle class, you know, through our mortgage interest deductions, um, a college saving bill. So, so I just want us to think hard about what we mean when we talk about capitalism. So give us some ideas some of your ideas for how you would correct this. It, really, it's simple. I mean, we know how to create wealth for families. We did it through the FHA. We did it through the New Deal. So I've suggested um, you know, a new Homestead Act that takes some of the benefits of the last Homestead Act and without some, some of the bad parts and, and looks at how you know, cities uh, uh, evolve and, and, and looking at sort of revitalization um, that is not gentrification, right? So what you have in a lot of spaces right now is the stripping of uh, black spaces as whites are coming back in, right? So the FHA, whites left to go to the white suburbs and we're able to you know, gain from that. And now you have the reverse trend. And so a lot of black families are getting dis dispossessed of their homes and pe being resegregated into different areas. So disrupting those patterns and allowing people to have equity as their properties um, revitalize. I think looking really hard at what reparations looks like, every society that has taken from uh, you know, uh, when you look at you know the Holocaust, you look at South Africa, you look at the Japanese internment. We have done reparations. We as Americans have done reparations. Other countries that have done significant harm to a minority um, in breach of the social contract that we've promised. Our Constitution promised equal protection under the law in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and those promises were violated. So, what does damages look like, right? What? How do we make that right? You can call it reparations. You can call it damages. You can call it whatever it want, uh, you want. To, but what you have to acknowledge is the harm. And then go to step two and three is how do we actualize um, some, some remedies? About six years ago, I published a book on 1776, and it attempted to revise the traditional idea of the founding of the United States because it basically didn't make any sense to me because historians for the longest have known that the black population did not side with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison at all in their revolt against British rule because they had reason to believe 
that a purposeful vote was extending slavery in the face of the growing abolitionist movement in London. And so I wanted to at attack 1776 from that perspective. But then after I did that, uh, if you look at the 1776 book, it really begins in 1688 with the so-called Glorious Revolution in England, uh, which in my telling of the story leads to an explosion of the slave trade because basically to that point, the African slave trade had been under the thumb of the monarch, but the merchants went in on the action. And so they clipped the wings of the monarch, which leads to an explosion of the slave trade, driving slave sl uh, enslaved Africans in North America in particular. And as I tell the story, um, that provides kindling for 1776. So that led to a book on the 17th century, which came out, I guess, in 2018. But then after I did the 17th century, um, I figured I need to look at the 16th century, which leads us to the book in hand, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. This is basically a post-1492 book going up to the English uh, settling, quote unquote, what they call Virginia after the so-called Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth in 1607. But it starts a lot earlier, right? I mean, like- Oh, every, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can, I mean, yeah. Ostensibly, it's 1492, but actually, uh, I'm trying to understand why we're sitting here speaking English, right. considering mm -hmm. the fact that in the 1500s, this was a minor monarchy on the fringes of Europe. Mm -hmm. And so in order to understand that, I have to look at a lot of Western European history. And so in some ways, I go back to uh, 1095, the onset of the Crusades, right. where you have Western European Christendom deciding they want to reclaim what they call the Holy Land under the aegis of Muslim powers, uh, which in my telling of the story leads to a certain kind of, kind of othering, which is then transferred to Native Americans and people of African descent, seeing them as an alien force. And then an another pivotal date in my story is 1291 in England, when London expels the Jewish population <laughs> altogether. But not only do they expel the Jewish population, but the kinds of tropes that are used to disfigure rhetorically the Jewish population. That is to say that uh, they have horns, they have tails, they, they have order. an odor, right. they're not allowed mm -hmm. to engage in miscegenation. Well, those are transferred almost wholly to the black population once England gets started with the slave trade. And what's interesting as well is that uh, once you have the so-called Protestant upsurge in Europe post-1517 with Martin Luther, uh, 95 theses on the door of the church. You might recall that from your so-called Western Civ classes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Protestantism takes uh, London by storm. You may have heard the story about King Henry VIII uh, wanting to divorce, but uh, actually what it does, it leads him to uh, pillage and plunder Catholic property. Right. And then once he adopts Protestant faith. The Protestant faith is the state religion. This brings him into conflict with the Catholic powers. He then makes an alliance with the alleged enemy of Christendom, which are the Muslims. That's one of the key reasons why we're sitting here speaking English, because of his alliance with the Muslim powers right. against the Catholics. And then the Catholic, the Spanish Catholics, they had a religious qualification for settlement. You could be a black conquistador or conqueror, as long as you profess Catholicism. Right. London took a different position. You didn't have to be a Protestant to be a settler under the Union Jack. In fact, if you look at the history of Maryland, it was mostly settled by uh, Catholics right. from England. He moved, the L Londoners or England moves to a pan-European project, which morphs into whiteness, which morphs into white supremacy, that is to say, that the Jewish population, which had been scorned and expelled by 1291, uh, or then those who are remaining are embraced because they need warm bodies to confront the Native Americans and restrain the Africans. And of course, the Irish, who had been in conflict with London for centuries, and that conflict was turbocharged once London adopts the Protestant faith and many of the Irish stick with Catholicism. Uh, London even embraces Irish as settlers and Scots. Of course, there had been this long time, long term conflict between England and Scotland, which is going to 
probably lead, I would say, in the next decade to Scottish independence. And so this, in sum, is the story that I tell in this new book. Well, you know, what's interesting is that you have all of these conflicts in Europe, uh, English versus Irish, English versus Scott, ultimately British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Russian versus Ukrainian, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian, Serb versus Croat. I mean, I could go on right, in, right. Power in this regard, but all of a sudden in a rebranding exercise that would make Madison Avenue blush, once they cross the Atlantic, they adopt a new identity, which is whiteness, right. <laughs> which is right. quite curious to put it mildly. And obviously this unites them on a common platform it also contributes, I would say, to class collaboration, not only to ethnic right. reconciliation, because it leads to a certain kind of alliance between poor and richer Europeans, oftentimes on a common platform of taking the land of the Native Americans and doling it out between and amongst them. A big part of, of this, I think, right, of your thesis is that um, is that the fear of well, I'll ask you, what would you say, a bit, uh, can you can you talk about what you think one of the major contributions of this book is, like in terms of what, what it contributed to scholarship, um, what it was that you were out to correct, and what you think other historians hadn't sufficiently examined? Um, well, it, it, it's very basic. I mean, yeah. if you pick up many textbooks by reputable U.S. historians, they oftentimes begin the story of, say, slavery in 1619, for example. Right. Even though, I'm sure, if they were pressed, they would acknowledge that the Spanish from St. Augustine, Florida, had enslaved Africans from 1565. Another aspect of this story that I think is a contribution is just really trying to explain how this minor kingdom on the fringes of Europe, whose language we're now speaking, right. uh, got into the passing lane. And by, I th um, excuse me if I said this before, but by the time that the settlers from England arrived in what they call Virginia in 1607, the Spanish were so tied down in Florida, fighting the Native Americans and fighting their black allies, that even though they wanted to sail north to confront the English in what they call Jamestown, they were so tied down, they were not able to. And so that's one of the major reasons why London was able to get this foothold in North America. And then, of course, I pushed back the story of the arrival of slave Africans even before 1565, that is to say to the North American mainland, uh, to the 1520s, because the Spanish were repeatedly trying to establish a foothold in North America. Uh, they brought enslaved Africans to what is now South Carolina in the 1520s. But the, the Africans revolted, ran, ran away to the Native American population, then chased the Spanish back to their perch in Santo Domingo. So that's also part of the story. And of course, the Ottoman Turks are a major part of the story. And, and, and sort of the existential fear that was induced in Western Europe when the Muslims ousted the Christians from what is now Istanbul and threatened to continue moving west, um, which in some ways impels the Iberians, the Spanish and the Portuguese, to start moving <laughs> west in response, which helps right. Columbus to encounter the Americas, as is said. And so the Muslims and the fear of Muslims play a, play a, a, a major figure play a, a major role in the story. And in fact, uh, part of one of my footnotes talks about the New Zealand mass murderer, right. whose name we're not supposed to mention. Um, before he engages in that mass murder in New Zealand, he does a tour of the Balkans and issues a number of state anti-Muslim statements about what the Muslims had perpetrated. Because, of course, the Muslim, the Ottoman Turks, they were they were an equal opportunity in slavery. I mean, they right. were enslaving Africans, they were enslaving Albanians and Serbians and Bulgarians, and knocked on the doors of the gates of Vienna more than once. As Englishmen were sailing south to try to enslave Africans and West African, 
West Africa, they, had, they were running the risk of being enslaved themselves in North Africa because Algeria was a major slave market for Europeans. And in fact, one of the ways in which the settlers here in North America dealt with the indigenous population was not only a simple genocide, or as some might have it, passive genocide because of pathogens right. that they introduced, but also they sold indigenous into slave markets all over the world. You can, I mean, figuratively, you can find Native American DNA all over the world in the North Africa and the slave markets of Istanbul, et cetera. So I, I think that part of the story that I tell, it's, as you probably know, scholarship is oftentimes siloed. It's mm -hmm. stone type. Uh, that is to say, a person will spend their whole career studying the manufacture of, of shoestrings in France in 1685, where in this book, I try to draw upon a number of different uh, stories and historiographies of Africa, of Europe, of the Americas, of South America, of the Caribbean, and weave it into one tapestry. One of the troubling abs absences of the lexicon of the U.S. left is the term settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's hardly used in academia. Right. And what other term right. describes what has happened in North America when you had this invasion from Europe, the ousting and liquidation of the indigenous population? I mean, what else is it? I mean, that, that's a troubling sign, I'm afraid to say, of a kind of political illiteracy uh, that uh, is quite concerning and troubling. Could you actually, um, as a as a major gift to the world, could you define because some I, I, there's an ignorance, but then there's also people I think often use certain terms like white supremacy without actually knowing what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, could you give kind of like a um, uh, a historian's um, uh, civilians guide historian's guide to civilians on <laughs> um, settler colonialism? white supremacy and uh, neoliberalism mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, you know, easy, right? In a sentence each. Yeah. Well, you know, you can yeah. reference my previous yeah. remarks with regard to the historical yeah. evolution of, of this uh, term white supremacy, but in some it's the, the process whereby predominantly those of European descent were able to establish themselves by dent of colonialism in the first place as a ruling elite, not least in the Americas, but ultimately in a good deal of Asia and Africa as well. Notice that I, uh, I, I sort of qualify the term because as you know, in the United States, you don't necessarily have to be part of the European diaspora to be considered white. I mean, look at Ralph Nader, for example, he's Lebanese Christian background, but then that ties into the other aspect which are the religious roots of white supremacy because he comes from a Lebanese Christian background. Right. I'm not so sure if he came from a Lebanese Muslim background, would he be if inducted name, right. into the hollow if hall of whiteness? Were, if his name were recognizably like Arabic sounding. Well, the, the same holds true for other populaces. I mean, for example, uh, in the book, there's a reference to the late Senator Paul Laxalt, L-A-X-A-L-T, who was a close comrade of Ronald Wilson Reagan. Yeah. Now, he was a Basque descent, Basque or the minority group in Spain. Yeah. And because That's his surname was not recognizably, quote, Hispanic, unquote, it allowed him to rise a bit higher because, of course, part of the project that unfolded in the United States in, in, involved uh, a systematic and systemic denigration of things Spanish, for that matter, even even not necessarily accepted into the hollowed halls of whiteness to show you the level of denigration that they've been subjected to. Now, settler colonialism is this process that mostly you could say uh, extends from um, from Europe to other parts of the world. Although there is recent scholarship that talks about a kind of Japanese settler colonialism in, say, Taiwan, uh, right. public, uh, 1895, for example, whereby this invading force uh, sets itself up 
as the ruling elite over other populations and then extracts the wealth, exploits the labor uh, for their benefit. Now, neoliberalism, of course, is a term that is a kind of shorthand for uh, a so-called free market, so to speak, uh, where everything is for sale. I mean, the, the, the exaggeration of neoliberalism would be uh, every 15 feet as you walk down a sidewalk, you have to pay a toll, for example. Fortunately, we have socialist sidewalks where you don't have to pay a toll right. in, in order to, right. to walk on the sidewalk. And this is this uh, sort of turbocharged capitalism uh, meant to benefit the 1% that then has been forced on the rest of the world by then US imperialism and their sidekicks, including the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, et cetera. So whereby a country such as Zambia, for example, about maybe 50% of their budget right now does not go to healthcare or education, goes to paying back debts right. uh, to bank banksters in London, New York, uh, et cetera. And that kind of class collaboration, I think, sheds light on the election of November 2016, when a so-called billionaire received 63 million votes. It's imprecise, if not impossible, for 63 million to be part of the 1% in a country of 330 million. Uh, we need an explanation that goes beyond just pointing to Fox News Ram. and Jeff Limbaugh, because mm -hmm. you know, I have, like other black people, I have Fox News as part of my cable package, but it doesn't prevent black people from voting against Trump nine to one or, you know, Rush Limbaugh is on my AM radio. Right. Apparently has little or no influence on the black community. So we, we need another kind of explanation. And I think that this deep dive into history uh, that's reflected in this book, which talks about class collaboration, which has been a founding principle of the United States, that is to say poor and richer Europeans collaborating across class lines for their mutual interests, because we should be clear, many Europeans did quite well in North America. There's no doubt about it. You would be naive to try to deny that. Of course, many did not. Uh, but it's, it's like in ancient Mexico where you put a carrot in front of the nose of the donkey get to mm -hmm. get the donkey to pull the wagon. Yeah. And now the donkey never gets to bite the carrot, but it keeps them pulling the wagon. So, right. you know, the, the prospect of right. gaining this wealth is enough to lubricate the path towards class collaboration. And even if Mr. Trump loses on November 3rd, and of course, you all have heard, sure heard of the talk of the coup, right. of the legal coup that's in motion. But even if he loses, we're still going to have to deal with this phenomenon. I, I think the Trump base sees this as a rare opportunity. And as, as, as the Trump uh, acolytes often say, this is a Flight 93 election. Mm -hmm. that you have to rush the cockpit, otherwise oh, right. the plane right. will crash into the White House. And so... Therefore, you have to support Trump no matter what, because this may be the last opportunity right. to turn back the clock. Yeah. And actually, they may be right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would hope this is the last opportunity to turn <laughs> back the clock. Look at David Brooks of the New York Times, for example, to, to get back to our punching bags. <laughs> so, you know, he signs this notorious letter about cancel culture uh, that was pinned by this uh, Ivy League professor who in 2016 writes a book and says, the reason Trump got elected was because of Black Lives Matter, because this right. organization so infuriated the Trump base that they saw no alternative but to put Trump in office. The other uh, co-author of this letter, whose name I will not repeat, is this light-skinned Negro who lives in Paris who wrote a book about how it's a shame he's not defined as white, All right, whatever. Yeah. And so they're complaining about cancel culture. And, and don't forget Barry Weiss. Never sign Barry, Barry, Barry also. Oh, Barry yeah. Weiss, all the way. Barry yeah, forever. Yeah, disappeared, fortunately. I'm but, sure she's watching a new thing with Andrew Sullivan. Yeah. Well, we're he talking. got exposed. That's for they're sure. They're probably in a chateau together working on the Ooh. new. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Type, that is so. the funniest thing is people will complain about cancel culture and Andrew Sullivan. I'm like, that's crazy what you did, what you sent someone. Anyway, sorry. Well, well just a footnote on Andrew <laughs> Sullivan. I mean, 
what what Ben Smith in the New York Times article from a few weeks ago was alluding yeah. to. But some of the stuff he put on Twitter about Nicole Hannah Jones in the New York Times was really awful. Yeah, yeah. It was the height of racism and sexism. Mm-hmm. I mean, if anybody should have been canceled, I mean, actually, I'll, I'll repeat it. I mean, yeah. So, so Nicole Hannah Jones was talking about the myth of the elongated black penis. And so, right. Andrew Sullivan says, Well, how do you know it's a myth? Have you done a study? You know. Right. And then he says, well, I was tipsy. That's why I, I, I said, you know, I was drunk. I mean, I haven't heard that since I was in college right. you know, using alcohol as a defense. But anyway, so David Brooks, he signs the letter too. remember in February after Bernie Sanders won the Nevada um, primary. Yeah. Brooks writes this column. Never Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, he was trying to cancel yeah. uh, Bernie Sanders. And that right. probably played a role along with other similar uh, words from never Trumpers in pushing for Biden's victory in South Carolina. Yeah. I mean, between that and the liberal media, like MSNBC saying that Bernie is like a, uh, the Nazis landing in France, right. um, RIP Chris Matthews, whose job was fine, <laughs> except for a me too thing. That's let's all be. Yes. It was that, nothing to do with saying that everyone was Nazis. He it's just was burning, like, yeah. he was pinching makeup ladies on the butt yeah. and stuff like, like that. Saying inappropriate things, and that's what happened. Um, but yeah, you know, Joanne Reed's body language expert. I learned a lot about Bernie from that. So yeah, anyway. But, but and, and, uh, and by the way, either. We, we, we by the way we see how how helpful these uh these never trump uh republicans are now that the supreme court thing is happening yeah. like all of them are very very quiet all of a sudden about amy coney right. barrett <laughs> well, mitt, romney, mitt romney is like yeah, mitt romney you know, openly is just like i'll openly. vote with it or whatever yeah yeah, yeah how, how do you see um oh i so sorry i cut you off you were talking about no, no, um no, no. uh sullivan and and the cancellation oh, letter no, and, no it's I, just i mean what, what they're trying to do for example uh, george will the bow tie popinjay of the washington post opinion page <laughs> so he's been writing these com- he's a never trump republican of course right. although, so he, he's led the republican party up to the brink of disaster i know now i love i'm so people. proud of all these people they were great with the iran contras these people <laughs> who, um you know don't like scandal or decorum violations they're fine yeah with- I don't know. Yeah. So he, he keeps encouraging the Democrats to attack Black Lives Matter because right. of the, quote, violence, unquote, that has been unleashed in the streets of Kenosha, Portland, et cetera. So once again, he's trying to give force the opposition to attack their base. So right. he's now he's now it, it, previously he was an enemy outside the gates. Now he's an enemy inside the gates. Right. Basically. Yeah. And inevitably, he'll have influence. And uh, we'll, of course, I mean, if, if I were Biden, in the Biden administration, probably. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's almost you can almost think of him as a triple agent, not as a double agent. Right. Yeah. And, and what about um, any any thoughts on the kind of from a historical perspective on the um on Amy Coney Barrett. I mean, her, just her religious identity is kind of like, I want to, I want to go in undercover in that. What's it called? The people who praise <laughs> or the hands, what are they called? The, she's like, mm-hmm. first of all, I thought the whole point of being a Catholic is that they have a monopoly. Like it's our way or the highway. The one true like, faith. One what? The one true faith. Yeah. I thought that was their thing. But, but these people that she's part of, they're like, they're mostly Catholic. They're almost all Catholic, but they don't really follow. They're not considered Catholic by them. Yeah, so what the hell is this supposed to be? This ties into the book, believe it or not. Yeah. Because at the end of the book, actually, you can turn to the last few pages. Yeah. I quote uh, Michael Wolf's book on uh, Trump, where Trump expresses surprise and bafflement that there are so many Catholics on the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. And he says something like, I thought this was this was a Protestant country. And of course, my comment is, is that apparently he doesn't not recognize the the efficacy of the construction of whiteness and the reconciliation between Protestants and Catholics and those who were Jewish, which helped to construct this new so-called white identity uh, with this new identity then encoded in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution which calls for religious liberty. And unlike the credulous historians who have suggested 
that this comes purely from their brains as a product of enlightenment. It's really a way to consolidate settler colonialism. And so, in other words, to have this formidable force powerful enough to confront the indigenous and take their land and restrain the rebellious Africans. And so now with Amy Coney Barrett's impending ascension to the high court, I think you'll have six Catholics uh, on the high court. And I also, um, I deal with this as well with regard to uh, William Crystal, another infamous. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to take on it. Uh, that's somebody else who has not mentioned Amy Coney Barrett once uh, over exactly. the last few days. Well, it's of course. That. We don't consider um, that part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a book. Uh, I think it's called Stars of David. You might want to read this book, uh, Professor Halper. It's, um, it's a book about prominent Jewish Americans. And I so. I I wasn't in it. <laughs> You may be. I should, yeah. Stars of David, yeah. I'll be in the sequel. <laughs> and so they talk about how um, Felix Rowe, you may remember him from the old New York days. He was the New York financier who winds up as ambassador to France. And he's passed away now. And the, the point is made that in France, they always refer to him as Jewish not necessarily to the same degree in the United States. And of course, the inference being that the United States is so much more enlightened than France. I mean, even though France supposedly has this idea about, you know, we're all French, which is why they only collect statistics about race, et cetera. Right. And so, but the point is, of course, is that in the United States, because of the reach of the construction of whiteness, uh, his Jewish identity in some ways is not as uh, potent as it might be in France, for example. And the other point that I make is that once again, with these halting steps towards desegregation and inequality, uh, it's inevitable that there would be a backlash and the backlash would not only seek to reach uh, black people, but those who are in the same electoral neighborhood as black people as well. And given the fact, say, that the Jewish population votes about 75% against the GOP, right. and that, that scenario that I'm making allusions to should not be ignored. Yeah. In other words, reference here, Charlottesville, August 2017, right. yeah, no, yeah. attack on the Pittsburgh synagogue, right. the attack on the center in Kansas City, um, the, the explosion as the Anti-Defamation Week would put it of uh, anti-Jewish incidents, uh, for example. I mean, people should not just assume, uh, although I know it helps people to sleep at night, that the status quo will perpetuate itself and that things can't go backwards. Right. You can go backwards. I mean, that's that's one of the many lessons of history is that right. things don't always move forward. Yeah. There was, we used to not have the death penalty. There was a time when it didn't exist yeah. in this country. And it came back, which is scary. Mm -hmm. Or slavery came back. I mean, for example, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution, there was a move to abolish slavery, not only in what became Haiti, but other French Caribbean islands. But then after the rise of Napoleon, slavery came back, <laughs> basically. Right. And then it took about four and a half more decades for it to be abolished again. So, you know, the, the narrative of the United States is that uh, there's steady movement forward towards a more pe perfect union. I just saw Bill Clinton say that the other day, in fact. But uh, I think that that's naive. It's idealistic. It may be meant to reassure so people can sleep easily at night. But I don't think you should be making wagers on that proposition. 